Hi, I'm Gigi Duban, and on this episode of Alabama Inc., we find out what the deal is with business incubators and why so many entrepreneurs want in. And Pat Duggan sits down with Michael Sellers, founder of Good People Brewing. And finally, correspondent Josh Sneed gets a look at Ed Waldrop's huge remote control planes. All that's coming up on Alabama Inc. incubators are in Austin, they're in New York. Nationwide, we've got about 1,200 of them. Back in 1980, there were 12. Here in Alabama, we've got a couple, but what exactly is a business incubator? Innovation Depot in Birmingham is the biggest incubator in the state. It partners with UAB and features 94 startup companies. Devin Laney runs the place. So our job is to help companies that come in the door stay focused, grow, graduate out of, the, out of the program into the community where they can continue to grow and have an impact. The incubator opened its doors in 2007. Since then, the number of companies there has more than doubled. So we started at that point with 40. We moved in here with 40. We now have 94 companies in the Innovation Depot. So we're the largest technology incubation program and facility in the southeast. We're one of the largest in the country. Uh, we focus primarily on early stage technology. Why technology? Because that is where we see the most rapid growth and the most economic impact. If you really want to have a knowledge-based economy, those are the kind of jobs you want. You want high paying jobs, very high skilled, knowledge-based jobs that's going to drive the economy going forward. It takes a different kind of setup when you've got almost 100 companies under one roof. And Laney says this building even has a little history behind it. Tell me about the space. Yeah, it's a, gr it's a great space. Um, this, originally, this building was a Sears department store. It was the largest Sears, I think, in the southeast. It's 140,000 square feet. It's a huge building. The biggest Sears in the southeast? Yeah, it was their department store. I think it was their flagship store. And so the building has a lot of character, and it's a great place. It inspires a lot of interaction among the companies. It inspires a lot of uh, creativity among the companies, and that's what, that's what we want. That was the, the premise behind the design. It's, it's almost like a, a, a college dorm. It's not uncommon to see people riding down the halls on skateboards. We have a bike share program. You can just check out a bike and go for a ride over to the baseball stadium or the, or the park. With such a great space, you'd think companies would be busting down the doors to get in. Well, they kind of are. So about how many applications do you get, I guess, any given year? Yeah, I can tell you that. We see, on average, I would say about 120 applicants every year, so about 10 a month. And then we accept into the program anywhere from, I'd say, 10 to 15. That's it? Per year, yeah. Um, a lot of that is that I would say probably half of those 120 are really not ready yet. This is, Innovation Depot is not the place to come on day one of your business. We look at the growth potential of the business. We look at the business model to make sure that it makes sense. And then we look to see, does this have the potential to really create a positive economic impact? Vehicles are essential to the success of your business, and managing your fleet is a huge responsibility. There's a lot to keep up with. Fuel receipts, service records, maintenance schedules. One of those tech startups is a company called Fleetio. It's a web-based software company that helps businesses manage their fleet of cars. Tony Somerville started Fleetio in 2011. 
We make it easy for people to manage vehicles and equipment, uh, specifically for businesses that have a fleet of vehicles, uh, hence the name Fleetio. Got um, it. So, so how long has Fleetio been open? Um, I started the company uh, in the summer of 2011, so almost two years. Um, have you been here the entire time? No, I actually started uh, just kind of working out of the house and kind of got it off the ground uh, and then moved in here last summer. But really I kind of knew, you know, as soon as I started looking for a space that I wanted to be here, um, just because I was looking for something more than just an office space, you know, I mean I wanted something that was entrepreneurial friendly, meaning, you know, it's flexible lease terms, you don't have to like, you know, pay for a lot of space in the hopes that you're going to grow into it. Um, but also there's just, I think, some sort of kind of, you know, energy and magic as far as being around other entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of running into them in the halls and you know, just getting to know people. Um, you know, I knew that this was kind of the right place for me, so I didn't really look too hard at other places. So low rent, ping pong table, weight room, free bikes, even a connected restaurant. When you're trying to get a business off the ground, Somerville says these are things you can't really put a price on. It's incredibly... Uh, rewarding to be doing your own thing but it's I mean it's it's difficult and being around other people who are kind of going through the same thing as you um, is is you know ex I mean, it's so valuable that like you kind of become kind of this this community of friends more or less because um, you know you're all sort of going through the same thing and, and we may not be in the same industries and doing the same type of product and everything but if you see somebody in the building having success with a particular part, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. Just to, everybody's pretty open and willing to kind of help each other out. Um, so yeah, that, that happens fairly often. How does Innovation Depot benefit? I mean, how, where do you win in all of this? For us, the more companies that I can have come through the program, graduate successfully, and continue to grow and hire people, to me improves the entire ecosystem. I call it an ecosystem. So the entire innovation ecosystem in this region, and it attracts more of those kinds of people, more of those entrepreneurs, those young entrepreneurs, it attracts them. I feel like the more success our companies have, the more success the ecosystem, the broader ecosystem will have, and then therefore the more success we'll have because we'll have more companies and we'll have more economic impact. And that's how we measure our, our success is the impact. Coming up next on Alabama Inc. When we started in 08, we were the only one. We tried to set the bar on the styles of beer and the, and the way the beer is produced. True story, I've got to be probably the only person on the planet who discovered beer after college. But if you go to your local store, your restaurant, or your bar, you'll find a lot of regional beers out there too, including good people brewing out of Birmingham. Now how important are they to the local economy? Let's put it this way, the Birmingham Barons baseball team thought enough of them to set up shop right across the street from the brewery. Here's Michael Sellers and how they got from here to there. Well, Michael, this 4th of July is going to make five years for you guys since the founding of Good Peoples. Now, you're, you've got your own brew pub at uh, Birmingham Shuttlesworth International Airport. I do the shopping for the Duggins family, so I see you guys in cans at the local supermarket. Did you think, when you first started out, that you'd be this far along five years later? Yeah, you, you know, you have dreams of, you know, where you'll be in five years. I think it, materializing is a lot different than the dreams, right? Um, it doesn't seem as far along as I think the dream does because you've had to watch all the growing pains uh, between those five years. But uh, no, it doesn't seem like long ago. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where you do kind of look back on where you started and kind of amazed how you've gotten to where you have. So, How did you get started? We were home brewers. Um, so we, we did home brewing, uh, kind of, you know, forged our craft that way. Um, and then just looked for opportunities and found an opportunity at the old mill location down in Southside, which um, allowed for us to um, kind of move into the professional world, professional realm. Alabama's Brewery Modernization mm -hmm. Act that got passed in 2011, I mean, that, that kind of like was the opening, you know, flag for everybody to start, you know, doing craft beers, that sort of thing. And I was kind of wondering, between 2008 and 2011, I mean, what did you guys do? Wear dark glasses and phony beards? Well, no, it? no, what, what the brewery modernization did was allow us to sample product out of our manufacturing facilities. 
prior to that, we didn't have that revenue stream. So, and that was probably one of the major reasons that breweries never really had a chance to make it in um, Alabama. It was just the revenue ability. It's very hard to grow. You have to be very well capitalized to grow from, uh, you know, a production facility, a package facility, without the added revenue stream of, of the uh, tap rooms. And that's why I think we've seen a lot of, of breweries being able to open up is that you get that initial uh, injection of cash through, through a revenue of the tap room. Well, this is, this is our, our tap room. There's actually two sides of it. This is the inside, and then we actually have another uh, area outside as well, which we'll see here in a little bit. But uh, yeah, so this is where we can do samplings, kind of and you know, educate people on uh, our brands and kind of on craft beer. We also, we've done uh, several, um, we do some cheese tastings in here, beer and cheese tastings. Yeah, so we'll walk around, we'll go around the outside to the brewery and take a look around there. What was the biggest growing pain as far as like, okay, we want to make a brewery and now we're here. And it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is the big snag. Well, I, I think, and it's probably like this in a lot of um, businesses that go from hobbies to business, is you have to learn the business of your hobby. Um, so brewing beer is, is one aspect of it, but there's a whole economy wrapped around uh, the craft beer or beverage industry in general. And then smaller segment now is craft beer industry. So that's, that was, that's, and it still is a challenge, always learning you know, about the, the beer industry. Now this is what you get to see through the windows of the tap room. So what, what do we yeah, have going absolutely. on here? Absolutely, yeah. So, so these are our fermentation vessels. Uh, these guys are uh, 60 barrel fermenters, which uh, equates to about what people think of, it's 120 kegs, what people think is a, a half barrel keg or a large keg. It's about, a, the capacity in those are 120. And the larger ones, those are 120 barrels, so that's 240 kegs uh, capacity in that uh, guy there. So. so how long from like, you know, first mix to fermentation to it winds up in somebody's we're, can? We're around about 18 to 21 days to get on the store. So not, not too shabby there. And then over here we have our um, canning line. So that's where everything is canned. So everything is uh, canned and packaged in house. Now out there, you've got like, you know, you've got your, your, your Buds, your Michelobes. I mean, they've been around for a long time. All of a sudden, here comes, you know, good people. What, what were the, the early challenges as far as like getting a restaurant to say, okay, we'll serve this. We're getting a supermarket to say, okay, we'll, we'll offer this to our customers. Right. I, well, I think our challenges was a little less than it is today because there's so many varieties out there. Again, when we started, there wasn't that much variety and there certainly wasn't a very large local variety, which there is today. So challenge is probably more so now than it was at that time. At that time because we were the first so it helped <laughs> there's a growth scale that you know a lot of times when you're you're small and you don't have a lot of distribution you can put out a lot of SKUs or a lot of different brands but as you find your core brands and the demand for those brands come up then obviously those those take more capacity and that's kind of where we are in our growth cycle is that we're really focusing on our core brands um, but as we, you know, hopefully as we grow, we'll be able to add more capacity for adding more additional uh, beers that we are kind of enjoying, smaller scale, smaller release versions of beers. Um, but right now, I think in our growth cycle, we really are trying to make sure that we supply the market with what we said we would supply the market with and not kind of shotgun blast, you know, a lot of beers out there and see what sticks. We've kind of already been past that. You mentioned earlier about like, you know, the beers that would be produced up in, uh, in Huntsville, you've got some down in Fairhope, that sort of thing. Is that kind of like, you know, pulled you all together as a community or is it kind of like, you know, uh, them versus us, that's the, the sort of competition going on? Yeah, no, I, I think it, it just pulls together. There's an Alabama Brewers Guild now, so um, there's enough breweries that we can kind of rally around issues that affect us um, as, a, as a brewery, as a manufacturer. Um, so it's helped in that regard in that we have a, a unified voice, which we didn't have before. Um, but, you know, when we started in 08, we were the only ones, and we were the only ones for a couple of years. Um, but I tell you what, it does allow you, or it does encourage, you know, you to step up your game. I mean, that's been a really good thing for us. Um, we try to set the bar on the styles of beer and, and, the, and the way that beer is produced. Um, so, for us, it's been a good thing. I mean, we, we enjoy the guys. I mean, we see them at festivals all the time. Uh, we were down in Montgomery yesterday at a tourism conference all together. So there is a, there's a great communal spirit between the, between the breweries for sure. Coming up next on Alabama Inc. The bigger they are, my wife says, well, you got a pickup truck flying around up there, you know, <laughs> money-wise.
They're big, they're loud, and they're not cheap. Josh Schneed gets a look at Ed Waldrop's remote control planes. I don't know what you have planned for your retirement, but I'm gonna eat a lot of pudding and watch Judge Judy every day. Well, Edward Waldrop has a different plan. He spends his retirement collecting and building RC model airplanes, and he has over 20 of them. Some of them have wingspans of up to six feet. Let's go check them out. So Ed, tell us where we are today. We're at the West Alabama Modelers uh, Flying Field, located on Wall Metal Road. And you guys come out here a couple times a year and uh, have events and... Areas. Every week. We, every fly, week we fly every week. So you told me before uh, you started doing this when you were eight. Eight years old. How did, how did you get into it? How did you get started? Uh, my grandfather. My grandfather bought me my first little, it was a little Cox P-51. Uh, with an 049 engine on it. With a, I don't know what any of that means, lines. but it yeah. sounds very sweet. It is. Oh, it's great. So you've been at it for a while then? Oh, yes. So what do your other retired friends think about what you do for a hobby? Uh, some of them think it's foolish. Really? Uh, other, um, uh, you know, other people that's been in the military think it's fantastic. Now, why do they think it's foolish? Is it because you spend a lot money of money wise, doing it? Yeah, money wise. What they, do they spend their money doing? Uh, bass fishing. Okay. You See, know? So it's, that's it's dumb to me. Yeah, <laughs> So let me ask you, what kind of price range are we looking at with the planes we're going to see today? Uh, anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000. The radial that's on my P-17, mm -hmm. that's $2,000. Yeah. Engine by itself. Wow. But that's a big investment. Is that a real Receiver. plane landing behind me? No, that's actually a turbine jet. That's actually one of the jets we're talking about, and, and that plane right there. I could probably fit in that. What are the odds? I could probably fit in that, right? That one's a high dollar airplane, trust me. There's, there's a $10,000 airplane. That's a $10,000 yes. That's what $10,000. Well, we always say it's never a pilot error, it's always something else. Does he have a name? Do you got a name for all your pilots? No, not really. How about you guys? Do you guys have call signs? No. Wow. No call signs. Wow. Huge part of flying a plane. Oh, I know. You That's know, probably one of the cool. You should have... If I was I'm a Top Gun, and, I probably we, would have one. Can we call you Snake Eyes for the rest of this? Yeah, trip? you can call me Snake Eyes yes. if you want to. But, so let's start painting that on some of your stuff. Okay? Yeah, put, put Snake Eyes on it. But. We have a saying that it, somewhere in that plane, there's a stamp with an expiration date. Because okay. sooner or later, something's gonna happen. Sooner or later, you're gonna and, find that. And there's people that's had airplanes 30 years yeah. and fly them. And then wow. all of a sudden, that's it. Yeah, you never know, right? You never know. Watching you guys, uh, what did you call it when you were coming back with the wrecked plane? I call it the walk of shame. Right. <laughs> no, or walk was... of blame, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> right. But you feel so bad, you know, and, you, and if you noticed, everybody's come up, pat you on the back. Yeah. You know, man, I'm so sorry. You and know? everybody went out there to help you get all the yeah, pieces in. Yeah, they do. Stuff. That's the camaraderie and the fellowship because they know how it feels. They've been there. They've done that. Because you get this queasy feeling in the pit of your stomach. And it's just like you just lost your best friend. But the one that went down was kind of rare. You can't get that one. No, that can't so be So that's fixed. why it hurts a little extra. Yeah, it hurts in your pocket. Yeah, because you're out that investment. You know, you're out the airplane. I had 33 at one point. Wow. I'm back to about 21 right now. Actually, now I'm down to 20. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> oh no. Well, how much do you think you, over that time, that you spent on your hobby? Let me put it this way. When I got into the hobby, this. my wife had a legal pad, the big yellow legal pads. Every time I bought something, she wrote it down. And when she filled up that pad and she said, you know, you've got over $30,000 invested in these airplanes. She says, well, you got a pickup truck flying around up there, you know, <laughs> money-wise. You can't mentally think about the money. You, you, you're in it for the, for the hobby, for the joy, for the excitement, and for the adrenaline. Nothing more. I'm starting to get nervous. I feel like I'm flying somebody's Xbox around. Okay. If I smash this thing. You ready? Yeah. There you go. You're flying. All right, go right. Just a little bit right. Easy. Just very little input is all you need. And just wait for it. Give it a little bit and then wait. And it'll start to turn. Oh, he's gonna come up and fly with you. All right, let's see what we can do about crashing that other guy's plane. No. No, no, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Landing. Let's see this thing land. Fly crazy. Come on. Come on. There you go. One more time. Come on. Yeah, you're doing good. There he is. Look at that. Look, he's there. Nice. <laughs> right there. Uh, how about yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> That's our show for this week. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Check out the stories we're working on and tell us what you think. I'm Gigi Duban and we'll see you next time on Alabama Inc.